episode 36. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch Bartlett Sears, AIA, host of the Business of Architecture show. Now, maybe you're a diehard listener of Business of Architecture, or maybe you're a new listener. I'm going to try something new here for a couple of episodes, and I want to see how it goes. So here's the deal. Leave this show a review on iTunes with your constructive feedback, and I'll read your name and a brief message over the air. Now, this will do two things. It will help me make the show better, and it will bring you more of what you want to hear. Now, you can do this one of two ways. You can visit iTunes and search for Business of Architecture and leave the review there. Or you can go to businessofarchitecture.com, visit the show page, click the iTunes link, leave your feedback there, and make Business of Architecture yours for 2014, because that's what it's about. I'm doing this for you, and your support is appreciated. In today's episode, we're going to talk with Kyle McAdams, AIA. He's a licensed architect, and he is the former managing director of marketing and business development for the American Institute of Architects. Now, during our conversation, Kyle's going to talk to us and tell us about the three C's and the four P's of marketing, basically marketing 101 for architects. Listen, I'm not going to beat around the bush here. The information we cover in this in these next two episodes are going to give you information that will put you ahead of 95% of the other architects out there. So if you want to get more of the right kind of projects, you want to dominate your local market, get out a pen and paper because you'll want to take notes. Here's the show. Well, welcome back, Agile Architects. Today joining us is Kyle McAdams, AIA. He's a licensed architect. He's a former managing director of marketing and business development for the American Institute of Architects National. And in his own words, he is an evil genius marketer. (laughs) So he is an experienced marketing and business development executive, and we look forward to talking to him about marketing for architects. So Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks, Enoch. It's great to be here in person. Uh, I've watched many of these things, never actually taken part, so it's pretty cool to be here. That it, you know, and it is an honor. Thank you for spending your time to come and share your knowledge with, with architects and talk about business of architecture and talk about marketing. Yeah, my pleasure. So it's, an interesting, it's an interesting combination how you, you're, you're a licensed architect, but you have the specialty and focus on marketing. So yep. tell us how that happened in your career and also... Um, just a note there, let's um, move your camera down just a little bit or maybe your screen so your head's a little higher. There we go. That's good. So we get you in full full frame. Yep. Yep. A little bit, a um, little bit back a little. A little back? So there, How's that? there you go. That's good. Perfect. All right. Good. So, it's all about presentation. You bet. So tell us a story. So licensed architect to, um, you know, how did you, what took you from being a, a, an architect to being the former managing director or the director of marketing and business development for the AIA? Um, well, I, w- I would say I've always been an architect. So once you're an architect, I think we all believe that. Once you're an architect, you're always an architect, no matter what you're doing. And many of us take some different paths. For me, um, I was uh, very fortunate uh, coming out of business school, not a business school, out of uh, architecture school, to go work for the Cambridge Seven uh, Associates up in uh, Boston and got to work on some really exciting projects with some really smart people. Who are the Cambridge and, Seven? What's that? What is the Cambridge se- Seven? Tell me about them it, and their work. Cambridge Seven is a, is a very, uh, well, it's, a, it's about a 40-year-old firm in Boston, and if you know the uh, New England Aquarium in Boston or the National Aquarium in Baltimore, um, those are all Cambridge Seven uh, projects. I think in 1993, uh, they won the... Uh, Firm of the Year Award. So they're uh, a pretty long, well-established firm in uh, Boston, New England, and uh, they're kind of known worldwide as the uh, aquarium firm. That's their real claim to fame. Um, And I worked there. I didn't work on the aquarium projects. I worked on the the ones that made money, um, the the, the less glamorous. I worked in a lot of uh, shopping malls and uh, movie theaters. And uh, they were actually you know, really interesting because uh, both of those types of projects 
when you design, you're designing with business in mind and a business process and a business operation. And uh, I was really um, getting intrigued by it and uh, loved working with my clients and uh, started thinking about the business side of things and uh, decided to go to business school. Um, so I went back to business school, and while I was there, I really uh, became fascinated with marketing. Um, I don't think people, I don't think people who aren't in marketing uh, always uh, know that it, how strategic it is. And I compare it. I think actually most architects are probably we could be wired to be great marketers because it is really about designing a marketing strategy. You're just not, you know, working with visuals, but you're working with uh, understanding consumers and developing a strategy and a product around those consumers, much as you would be, uh, you know, developing a program around a client and, uh, you know, building a building well, around tell, that Tell client. me a little bit more about that because, you know, for a lot of us, marketing is sort of a different language. So when you say str being really strategic about us, about it, help us understand what you mean by that. What does that mean? Okay. Um, I, this, is the, this is the way I think about it. If you ever go through a marketing uh, class, probably one of the first things that they're going to tell you about is to always remember the three C's and the four P's. And that's just that's the, the baseline of marketing. Uh, all the thinking goes around those things. And the three C's are the company, meaning you, the company you are. What are your strengths and weaknesses? What can you do very well? What do you uh, not do? And you have to decide what is it. I'm going to do, am I going to make dishwashing liquid? Uh, am I going to make soap? Am I going to make tires? Okay, and if I do make tires, do I make racing tires? Do I make, uh, uh, you know, snow tires? Uh, if I'm a dishwashing liquid, am I going to fight grease or make shiny dishes, make your hands soft? Uh, decide who you are, what you do well, and don't try to do all things to all people. Um, the second C is the customer or the client or the consumer. You can put the C to any of those, but it's really who you are trying to uh, serve. And you, you, if you're going to find a, a client or a customer, you want to find one that that's looking for what you need, right? So it's, it's sort of like a yin and a yang. they got to go together. You can't be trying to force feed the wrong client uh, things that you don't do, right? So... You, deciding what your company is um, helps you realize who the customer should be. And finding the customers um, that you can serve best uh, means you're going to perform best, you're going to be happiest, and your customers are going to be just as happy. But that's a very strategic decision that you have to make. And uh, I don't think people realize how much thought and uh, strategy goes into that. And then the other C is give me, give me an example. I'm going to pause you right there because this is such... This is great information, Kyle, and I don't want I don't want you to gloss over anything that to you might seem second nature because you're a professional that does this and the lay right. the lay people like myself out there who are learning from this process. So, um you say there's a lot that goes into that, you know, the second C which is the client and the first C which is the company. Can you sort yeah. of give me sort of an example to help me understand what's so complex about that and I guess how to do it correctly? Okay. Um so let's say uh, you want to uh, – an example, I, I'm going to also be jumping into one of the P's as well. There's the product. So the product is what you are developing for the customer and uh, the client. So you're having to uh, find um, something that you see people want. So, you know, let's say you, you, you're Starbucks, right? And you're not Starbucks yet. You're just Howard Schultz, right? Let's say and, we're an architecture firm. Can you can you switch it and say? Okay, let's say we were an architecture firm, right? Um, and uh, I have experience with, uh, let's say, schools. I, I worked. I used to work for a big firm, and I did a lot of school work, so I know a lot about you know, designing schools. And I'm going to start my own firm, and. Uh, Gosh, you know, I, there's so many things I could do. I think I might, you know, want to design uh, kitchens. Well, I don't have any expertise in that. Uh, I could develop it, but maybe I can get started a lot quicker if I know uh, I can do schools and if I feel like 
I have enough bandwidth and the right people uh, to do schools. And if I don't, I have to you know, find the right people. And can I afford them? And all those kind of questions have to say, that's, okay, that's what I'm going to do, so I have to gear up to do that. And can I afford to gear up to do that? Okay, that's great, but am I in a market where there are going to be schools? Right? Or am I, do I live in the desert and uh, there's not another city around for you know, 300 miles? Well, you're probably not going to do well designing schools. Do I, do I live in a growing community uh, where lots of young families are moving into um, that's going to explode uh, uh, with development? Yeah, though that sounds like a pretty good place to do schools. Uh, so those two things are, are critical. So then you might start thinking about the product. So when you want to pitch yourself as doing schools, what kind of school are you going to be uh, saying, this is what I do really well? Sustainable, you know, sustainable schools, and, and that's, you know, it helps if that's what you've done in the past, but uh, you've got to figure out what the product is that you're going to be making, and they're all sort of symbiotic, the, the, the customer, client, and uh, the product kind of all go together. And you sort of, and you equip yourself to do that. That means you're staffing uh, the technologies you're going to be using. Uh, but knowing those things, you can start to address um, many of the other P's and C's and, and that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, so that's part of the strategy. You give a very interesting example that made me think about, for instance, when, let's take the school example. Say I'm an architect and I'm wanting to target school districts. Would you recommend, in terms of product or service in our case, would you recommend focusing in on a tiny little area of the school district needs? Like, for instance, maybe classroom remodels or maybe yes. ADA compliance, as opposed to just saying, hey, we're a school architect and we'll do anything and everything for schools. Tell me yeah. about that. Especially if you're just starting out, right? especially if you're just starting out, find something narrow. The, the narrower you can be, the more of an expert you can be and the more of a specific problem you can be solving. Um, because, you know, clients don't, I mean, I'll say uh, most clients, most clients, most customers think in terms of needs and problems, right? If you are a noted problem solver and uh, need fulfiller, um, People are going to turn to you more quickly than if you are a, yeah, I do schools. I mean, eventually, you may be able to step back and say, yeah, I do schools. You've got to start somewhere solving a problem. And, and by doing that, you're making it a little bit easier on yourself because you've only got to worry about one thing to get really, really good at uh, before you expand to something else, as opposed to, like, trying to be all things to all people. You know, ADA compliance. You can say to people, I am the expert about ADA compliance. And you have questions about ADA compliance, ask me whether you, it's architectural or not. I'm the expert. And so being an expert like that, you're creating demand. If people have that problem, if people have that need, um, you are the solution to the demand they have. Okay. So let me just rephrase that. And um, in my own words, to make sure I'm understanding and our listeners can apply it to themselves, so, for instance, instead of going and saying, hey, I'm, a, I'm an architect and I do anything relating to schools, that would be basically telling them what we can do. But in terms of needs and solving problems, if I tell them, hey, listen, I'm an expert at ADA compliance and I can go through your school and if you have any projects that need to be done, I can tell you how, much, how it's going to work, you know, where you need to put the grab rails, where you need to put the ramps and how all that's going to work, that that mm -hmm. speaks a lot more to the specific problem and needs. Yeah, it's more salient, right? Um, you know, it's probably, I would think, more often uh, the kind of project that somebody needs to be fulfilled is going to rarely be like build me a whole school, right? It's going to be solve this problem for me, uh, and I'll come back to you again to solve that problem, but now I have a relationship with you. And so, yeah, you're an architect, right? Yeah, I do ADA compliance. Wow, could you, like, you know, uh, renovate a section of our school? Well, of course I can. Uh, and you can, I can guarantee you it'll be ADA compliant when I do that. But then you sort of, like, you've got that and you're expanding a relationship as opposed to, like, trying to overlay um, which need do you have right now, right? Rather than you, instead you are growing out from a, 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 a 
service you provided and a, um, a solution you provided in, in building the relationship from there. That's why it's important. One of the biggest uh, pieces of uh, marketing is staying in touch with the clients you have, right, and the ones you've already provided services for, not forgetting about them and, you know, okay, you're done, now I've got to go find more clients. It's equally as important to stay uh, involved and engaged with the client you have already uh, solved for. Even if it's building a house and you think, well, you know, they're not going to, you know, they, they built their house, they live in it, how many houses can you have? Well, they probably have a lot of friends um, that will need houses, and the most likely person to uh, build a house is somebody who either knows somebody who has built a house or they built one before themselves. So that's some of the uh, best spent marketing time and money uh, that you can have, and it, you can spend, and it's probably the, the cheapest uh, because you've already got the relationship. You're not having to build the awareness or build the consideration. They already know you, and you've already got uh, an ongoing relationship with them. And you're building a network, and your network is not just uh, you know, who I know and who I can call on, but they're also the people that are going to be marketing for you to the public. So like you're building yourself a, a marketing network of your very own who, who hopefully will speak highly of you and be doing work for you. Okay. I think that's something that most architects have is past clients. And give me, can you give me some examples of how architects can keep in contact with past clients? Right. Um, well, you know, just checking in saying, hey, you know, anything needs work, anything needs to be revisited, that's always, it's a given. But then you can also be bringing more information. So information is power, um, and it, it makes you look more and more like an expert. So for schools, there may be some innovation so, or, or change in, in uh, codes they not, may not be aware of. ADA compliance, I don't know if that's going to change again in the future, but when it does change, that's an opportunity to go back to all of your previous clients and say, hey, just want to let you know about the new changes uh, in you know, ADA rules, right? And, and so you're not, you're not fishing for business as much as you are notifying them of uh, innovation and changes in the industry. So you're adding value without, they haven't had to pay you for that. But you're just really, in your own mind, uh, your marketing, right? Uh, there's, if, if the opportunity does arrive, it's a chance, actually, it's just a chance to have a conversation with them again and have them once again look to you as the expert who solved my problem in the past and is letting me know, has done me a really big favor of uh, bringing me up to date on some other specific issues. So, uh, you know, innovations or just letting them know about some other work that you've done. Hey, just want to let shows you, so you, excuse me, uh, show you some other schools that I've worked on and uh, just check in to see, uh, you know, if, and, and you know what, if people are happy with you, they're always going to be happy to uh, refer you. You can also say, like, hey, let me know. And if you know any other, you know, principals or school board members or if it comes up in conversation, I would really appreciate it if you could pass along my name. And you can even leave them a stack of business cards. He may throw them away, but he'll, like, remember or she will remember um, that you are there uh, seeking their help. And if you've helped them, people are going to want to help you back. You know, I really like that because I know that a lot of us struggle with, for instance, when we want to reach out to people and we want to try to drum up work, it often feels like we're approaching it from a position of weakness because mm -hmm. it feels like we have the need, it feels like we need the work, and there's almost a little bit of desperation there. So we lack confidence when we make those calls. But I like yeah. the way that you're approaching it, Kyle, because then it gives me some ammunition I can call, and it's not just, hey, I need some work, it's, hey, I'm just checking in, and I want to see how it's going, and hey, there's some changes happening with the new year, I wanted to make you aware of you know, what you're going to be looking at for the next year, and um, sounds sounds like a very effective way to do it. Yeah, So and it is. It is an easier approach, right? I mean, people, people like to work with people they like. And if you just take the approach that, you know, I'm just here to find people I like and stay in touch with the people I like, you're basically marketing without feeling like you're hard selling or being desperate. You're basically building your network um, 
and you would hope that they're almost like your friends, right? Um, you know, uh, maybe that's going too far, but I, I don't think so because, like I said, uh, people like to work with people they like. Yeah. So that's a great takeaway. So I'm going to challenge any of our audience members who are out there wondering how they can apply some of this to their firm and to their business. Map out a day, take out your list of old, old contacts, and just start dialing the phone and just say, hey, it's me, just checking in, see how you're going. So that's a way to do it. Um, so, and if you do that, drop me an email or drop Kyle a, a little a note so we can know that you got something valuable out of this conversation, and we'd really appreciate that. Kyle, we've, so far we've talked about two of the C's and one of the P's. Can you run us through the rest? Oh, absolutely. Um, two of the C's, one of the P's. The other C is the competition, right? Uh, ideally, you want to go uh, a place where the competition isn't. Um, so if you can, so one of the things I think about, and you know, I've mentioned this to you before. Uh, I worked as a, you know, my my very first job in any architecture firm was basically a marketing intern for the summer for this eight eight person firm, and uh, what they were doing was they were trying to uh, build their practice of building schools. As you know, that's the sample I was uh, focusing on earlier because I focused on it before. Um, what we found was why stay this – this is in Austin, Texas. I went to the University of Texas School of Architecture, and um, there are a lot of architects in, in uh, Austin. And uh, when you're looking to do schools in and around, you know, near into Austin, you've got a lot of competition. But what we found is like, okay, when you start, you know, doing a 200-mile radius around Austin – and start, you know, let's stop thinking about the University of Texas and the high schools in Austin, but what about Dripping Springs or uh, Shriner or these places that, you know, there aren't any architects and people don't consider architects very often or talk to them very often. The competition is less. So if you can decide, you know, I do schools and I want to do them in, um, in, smaller areas. I'm not going to focus on universities. I'm going to focus on junior colleges. Um, suddenly, you are narrowing your competitive space that you're playing in, and you're also uh, limiting the amount of work you're having to do, and you get to target yourself um, in a place that you might have uh, be dealing from a, a, a position of strength as opposed to up against so many other um, you know, important uh, competitors that might have bigger advantages than you. So uh, figuring out the competition and, and figuring out how you're going to be different, right? It's all about differentiation. So we talk about, and once again, all of this is symbiotic. Right? It's all, it all works together, right? Um, this is the strategic part I'm talking about, is the, 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 the customer, the company, the um, product, and the competition define greatly it is what you are going to do. An example I like to use a, a lot is uh, um, dishwashing liquid. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, there was, you know, Joy and Palm Olive. You, so, you may remember some of the old uh, advertising around this. Joy cleans right down to the shine. Palm Olive, Madge, you're soaking it. What, dishwashing liquid? Oh, it's mild. Yes, it softens your hands. Softens hands. You know, leaves a clean shine. Um, what's another one? Uh, uh, I don't know, something else. But uh, people were, you know, so Procter & Gamble is trying to think of, okay, we've got to develop a new dishwashing liquid in this space. Um, and we ask consumers, what is it that's important to you? Well, you know, shiny dish and soft hands are important to me. Um, and so they're saying, well, maybe we need to develop something that, you know, softens hands. But there's really somebody already doing that. Well, let's do some testing. So they, they went into kitchens and uh, literally watched people wash dishes. And they were filming it. And they would come back to Cincinnati with the locations and watch these films. And something they kept seeing over and over again was the person put the dishes in and they would put their hands into the water to wash the dishes. And they would have this look on their face like, ugh. And they kept saying, what is that? Ugh. And uh, they started asking the question, what is that scowl you have on your face? And it's like, I hate going into the grease. Oh, 
the grease. Huh. So they go back to their scientists and say, hey, can we formulate something that cuts through grease? And they're like, sure. We've had it a long time. Just nobody ever told us they wanted it. All right. And so they developed Dawn dishwashing liquid, which, which is really, I mean, it's a, it sounds, you know, very inane and boring, but in, in the space of dishwashing liquid, Dawn is a relative baby compared to these other brands. Dawn came in probably uh, in the early 80s. Some of these other brands have been around for 50s, for, since the 50s and 40s. But in one year, Dawn became the number one selling dishwashing liquid in the world because of that differentiation, finding the customer need that was unspoken, that nobody else was uh, uh, solving for, they made a product based on those needs in the competition and what they were capable of doing that broke through the market because nobody had really even thought about it. Um, so those are the things I'm talking about. They're, they all work together. Um, the other P's, okay, uh, placement. Where are you going to sell this thing? Um, that's made it maybe seem obvious. But I would say look at books, right? 20 years ago, you sold them in a store. You don't see bookstores very often because somebody innovated and sold them online. Changed the whole uh, spectrum of the business. And suddenly you almost have to choose that channel. But because they chose that channel, that's what made Amazon a, a monster, right? Because they were the first to realize we can sell through this channel that nobody's even thinking about right now. So that's another big strategic uh, decision, which also said they're going to be selling to the, the smartest people who read the most books because they're going to be the ones online first, right? And they, they, they built themselves to do that better than anybody else by building uh, uh, the warehouses they have throughout the nation that they can give you, get you books so quickly. But they had to be able to make a decision. Our company can do that. Right? We're going to build ourselves to be able to do that. Um, so the channel is important. Now, architects, you know, I, I don't know, maybe somehow we can do it virtually. Or maybe, you know, we consider it uh, whether you're using them or not them. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an exact comparison, but I think you get the point I'm trying to make here is that you still need to think about it uh, in terms of how might you deliver differently than others. Um, and in uh, price. Am I the premium price? Am I Neiman Marcus? Or am I Walmart? You're going to have to uh, change your practice to be one or the other. Um, and if you're going to be uh, the premium price, whoever you are, you better be delivering a product that's outstanding. And if you're going to be the low-priced guy, you better be doing something that has high volume. Um, I think about, like, if I'm an architect, I can do lower pricing. Uh, if I have somebody like a gas station, right, who's going to do multiple uh, versions so I can repeat and repeat and repeat, and I can, you know, make uh, money off a thinner margin than I would if I'm doing, you know, houses or uh, skyscrapers or something like that. And finally, the last P is promotion. And that's actually what most people think marketing is. When you say marketing, everybody thinks of the advertising, the buy one, get one free, the brochures, but all that is is just the in promotion. And that is useless if you haven't done the other three P's and the other three C's. All the promotion is doing is communicating those things. It's communicating, this is what I do, and you're targeting your promotion to the customer that you want to do it to, and you're talking about the price, and all of those things have to be put together. You can't just throw out an ad until you know, this is why I'm different. Uh, a Walmart ad will be different than a Target ad. Walmart is all about bottom line pricing. Target is about design. It's still affordable, but they're not saying we're the lowest price, right? And because of that, I would say they have two very different experiences, two very different uh, uh, inventory and, and operations around those things to serve those clients better. And their advertising is much different. Um, so promotion is key, but you can't just throw it out there. It ha your promotion is communicating all of the other P's and all the other C's so that those customers that are out there saying, wow, I'm, I'm that customer. I have that need. That's who I'm going to go for, right? 
Um, so there it is. That's the framework of the strategy. And there's, you know, every, every, every one of those has implications in terms of how you structure your business, uh, which customer you're looking for, where you're looking for them, how you're going to deliver. But that's what I mean by it being a strategic uh, endeavor. And I think you begin to see why I believe that architects uh, naturally are really good about this because we are so good at thinking about all the various systems, um, all the implications that every design decision uh, requires and what you have to have done uh, before you make those final decisions uh, in terms of the preparation, in terms of the programming. It's very similar. It's, you're just dealing with uh, different aspects. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I have this, so I have this long list, Kyle, that I wrote here. I have the three C's. I have company, client, competition. I have my P's. I think I left one of them out. I have placement, price, and promotion. Placement, price, product. And product, of course, because you product. talked about that with the C's, the product. Okay. Mm -hmm. So going upon, you know, just what you, what you explained about this framework here, I know for a fact that most people think of marketing as the last step. When we think of marketing, we think promotion to us. I think that's what marketing is. But now looking at this list, I'm seeing here that the bulk of the work and the bulk of the effort and the bulk of the reward almost is put into these one, two, three, four, five, six steps before we ever yeah. even get to the promotion. That's absolutely right. And that's, what, that's my point is that people think of marketing as some sort of uh, afterthought, you know, let's throw together something to let people know we do work out there, as opposed to uh, the final communication of really who I am and what I'm doing strategically uh, to find the right, you can't, you've got to find the right clients. You can't find any client. You've got to find the right clients and you have to develop yourself to be able to serve them. And so your promotion, as much as anything else, needs to be saying, you know, not only come see me, but come see me if you want this and you're one of these kind of people and have this need. And that also might determine where your promotion is going to be, right? Uh, you may find that your promotion is uh, sitting in a PTA meeting telling people about, uh, you know, how to make homes more sustainable, right? And you may not need an ad, but the audience might be sitting right there and your ability to speak and communicate may be all you need, right? So buying an ad, you know, great if it's an ad in the right place, speaking to the right person at the right time. So it's just one, 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 one small part of it. There's so much more. Excellent. Ooh. Well, Kyle, I, I, I really appreciate everything you've shared with us today. I think this is a lot of really good information that we can implement. And in the second half of our interview and next episode, I know you're going to start to talk about what happens next. So we have the promotion, and then we're going to move into the funnel, the pipeline, and then how you, how you turn those leads. So this is sort of like lead generation. Next mm -hmm. episode, just to give them a little hint for what we have to expect, you're going to tell us how to turn those people into buyers. And clients. Absolutely. Good. And raving fans. I like that even better. Well, Great. Kyle, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Enoch. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Talk to you later. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world.
Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.